Hi guys, good afternoon. Thank you to everybody who has watched my videos lately, commented. Thank you very much. Today, I'd like to address a video that came out back in July. And when this video came out, I was so excited and I thought it had so much potential for exploring a huge number of new areas of investigation. And the, the video I'm talking about is Conspiracy R Us's video entitled Mud Flood Mansions and the Gilded Age Deception. This is actually his most popular video and it currently has 110,000 views. I liked this video so much that I wanted to investigate a lot of these ideas myself and see what I could come up with as far as material to present in a video. So that's what I'm going to stumble through today. Now before I begin to try and do that, I'd like to take a moment and summarize Conspiracy R Us's video because he covers a lot of different material. I highly recommend that before you watch my video here, if you haven't seen his video, Mud Flood Mansions and the Gilded Age Deception, that kindly you might like to go watch that video first. But I will, as briefly as I can, summarize the things he talked about in his video. He begins by talking about this age in America called the Gilded Age in the late 19th century and into the 20th from about the 1870s to the 1900s and a key feature at this time is the phenomenon of the robber baron who was a type of magnate of American business who sometimes would use unscrupulous methods to monopolize business and industry railroad tycoons, oil tycoons, mining tycoons. He goes further into dropping some of the names like John Jacob Astor, William A. Clark. This probably includes the Vanderbilts, the Rockefellers, families like this. And Conspiracy R Us goes on to mention how a lot of these robber barons used their wealth to supposedly build gigantic mansions. However, if you watch this video, the conclusion is that this is really just a cover story. Because if you follow my channel or his channel or a lot of other popular channels which discuss mud flood, then there's reason to be suspicious. And maybe these stories about these robber barons and their impressive Gilded Age mansions are really a cover story for the beautiful and impressive architecture that existed before some type of historical cataclysm or mud flood event occurred. A key feature in this video are the free energy fireplaces which appear in a lot of these old mansions and questions are raised as to the true nature of these fireplaces and more specifically the two objects which sit inside these fireplaces which have a mysterious use and defy explanation, not to mention a back plate that is often found at the rear inside the fireplace. Pointed out in his video is that strangely these fireplaces are often surrounded by flammable and precious household items such as books and paintings, not to mention sometimes the fireplaces themselves even look like they've been built out of wood. That's kind of my idea. Something I noticed. So it challenges the traditional understanding that these fireplaces were actually used for the burning of wood or coal or an open flame so as to heat a home. Conspiracy R Us takes a look at some specific mansions such as the Carnegie Mansion from 1903 and points out the mud flooded details and how there's a ground floor below street level and how the entrance is actually leading up to the second floor. And he also points out that many of these old mansions lack any photos which show their construction. And that's important because he also references some material which shows that some of these mansions officially 
were built by large teams of construction workers. So again, there really should be some photographic record of these very opulent, expensive mansions having been built. Another feature of these mansions is that they contained a lot of high-tech features, supposedly things like central air conditioning, private subway lines, and electricity. These are things which I hope to cover and expand upon in some of the things that I would like to talk about today. At around 28 minutes and 16 seconds, he summarizes his video, and based upon what he discusses within his video, he concludes that, that this Gilded Age is a cover story for mud-flooded mansions in America. I agree with this statement, and this is something I would like to explore myself. So here goes. Here is a picture of Richard Morris Hunt. I'll read the Wikipedia description. Richard Morris Hunt, 1827 to 1895, was an American architect of the 19th century and an eminent figure in the history of American architecture. He helped sculpt the face of New York City with his designs for the 1902 entrance facade and Great Hall of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty, and many Fifth Avenue mansions now lost to the wrecking ball. Hunt is also renowned for his Biltmore Estate, which is actually the largest private estate in North America, and I think biggest house, America's largest private house near Asheville, North Carolina, and for his elaborate summer cottages in Newport, Rhode Island, which set a new standard of ostentation for the social elite and the newly minted millionaires of the Gilded Age. I'm going to get right to my point as to what I think and what I'd like to prove, and that is that I don't think Richard Morris Hunt was truly the architect that they say he was. I don't think he actually designed all of the buildings that he's credited with. And the list of his architecture is very impressive and almost humanly impossible, seemingly, for one man to have built or designed. And as I'd like to show, a lot of these buildings that supposedly are attributed to him have signs of mud flood. So it seems illogical that these buildings would have even been built in the years that are provided for their construction dates. Here is a list of all of the buildings that are accredited to Richard Morris Hunt. The list is huge, and his achievements are monumental. I mean, this guy had a huge workload. Apparently, he designed all of these buildings, and it's not like he designed a few houses here and there. I mean, well, I'll take a look at it. He, he built a lot of buildings that are on the uh, Yale University campus, uh, Princeton University campus, the Fog Art Museum in Cambridge, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, administrative building at the World's Columbia Exposition, the Statue of Liberty Tower, it's just, it goes on and on, the Vanderbilt House itself. To me, these are projects which seemingly would take an architect years and years to develop a single home, and yet a list of his work shows at least 54 masterpieces of architecture. And to me, it just doesn't seem humanly possible for one man to design that many different buildings or projects. Not all of these works have Wikipedia articles attributed to them, but I'd like to cover the ones that are listed on Wikipedia to quickly demonstrate that many of these buildings have obvious signs of mud flood. Knowing what we know about mud flood, we know that mud flood indicates that buildings were likely from a previous era or age, at which point some type of inexplicable catastrophe happened which inundated many old mansions and buildings with mud. This is why I think Richard Morris Hunt himself is a cover story to explain all of these old mud flooded buildings. Was he a real guy? Uh, maybe. I don't know. Well, actually, he did have a son who was also an architect, and that's actually an interesting story because his son actually is attributed certain buildings, and his son's buildings also have signs of mud flood. Hopefully I'll get to showing that as well. 
Okay, so going down the list, here is the William K. Vanderbilt House, built between 1878 and 1882. I'm sure there's many interesting things I could read about it into this video, but I'd just like to focus on pointing out this has obvious signs of mud flood. Here is the Chateau sur Mer, which is in Rhode Island. Uh, supposedly built in 1851. And if I go on Google Maps and I try and look at the back of the building, it looks like there's some signs of mud flood. Here's a building called Ochre Court. New photos of it show a type of balustrade, almost like a wheelchair type ramp which is present at the front of the building but if we look at old pictures this balustrade is not there and we can see that there's windows that tend to return into the ground which to me look like mud flood windows. Here are the 10th Street Studio Apartments and you can see that there's a waist-high fencing which provides access to a below ground level floor to me these are signs that this below ground floor was just dug out because why would you put windows at a foundational below ground level the Stuyvesant apartments probably saying that wrong have cut off basement windows but they seem to match the windows which appear above them this leads me to believe that the original floor extended below ground level I guess it's worth mentioning that Hunt is also the architect for the Yale scroll and key tomb but I'm not really seeing evidence of mud flood on this one I suspect the entire exterior of this building has been refinished and some different fascia has been put on it at some point thanks to Google Maps we can see that the Howland Cultural Center has these foundational windows at its base again we're just covering buildings that are attributed to Hunt as the architect. Maybe I should have just used the gallery that Wikipedia shows at the bottom. Would have made things easier. Here's East Divinity Hall at Yale College, which was demolished, but it was built in 1869. It has some pretty good signs of mud flooded windows. Here's the Markand Chapel at Yale College. Please notice the basement windows. Here's the Association Residence Nursing Home, Amsterdam Avenue in New York City, built in 1883. But clearly this one has a dugout around the exterior of the building showing that the ground floor is below street level. Here's the Henry Gurdon Markand House at Madison Avenue in New York City. It was built in, in 1884 and since demolished and it has some pretty egregious examples of cut off foundational windows and an entranceway going up to the second story. Here's the Statue of Liberty pedestal built in 1881 to 1886. It's a hand-drawn sketch. Kind of interesting that in the 1880s they only have a sketch of this one of the most iconic places and there's only a sketch of construction here's the Eldridge Jerry house and you can see the same type of thing an exterior dugout with below ground windows below street level this mansion survived just 32 years it was demolished in 1929 to make way for the Pierre Hotel Here's the Fogg Museum of Art, Harvard University. Again, this was built in 1895 and destroyed in 1925. 30-year-old building torn down. Yesterday, I spent some time Googling all of these individual houses and I found a lot of examples of mud flood 
Unfortunately, I wasn't making a video at that time. But anyway, you've seen the examples I've just shown, and just a cursory look shows that many of these buildings have evidence of mud flood, which leads me to believe that these buildings existed prior to the time of the architect. I mean, I suppose a mud flood could have happened within his lifespan. Maybe I can put it this way. The good majority of Richard Morris Hunt's architecture were built in the 1870s, 1880s, and even into the 1890s. At least in those years we have photographic evidence, and there's no record that any kind of mud flood occurred within those decades, and yet all of his buildings have signs of mud flood. On that basis, I conclude that Richard Morris Hunt was not the architect of these buildings, and these buildings likely predate all of the official construction dates that are provided. I wanted to cover this as well. Hunt had a son named Richard Howland Hunt. The son, Richard Howland Hunt, born in 1862, followed in his father's footsteps, so we're told, and also became an architect and designed buildings. Here's one example of an architectural work that is attributed to Richard Howland Hunt, and that is the 69th Regiment Armory, Lexington Avenue, in Manhattan, New York City. And this was built supposedly in 1904 and completed in 1906. Well, if we look at Google Maps for the 69th Regiment Armory Building, we can see that this building has foundational windows which are below ground level. And there's even a dugout here. I thought this was neat here. Most of the exterior is dug out to accommodate for these below ground windows, except in this area which juts out and runs butted close up to the sidewalk. And I noticed that the area where it runs closest to the sidewalk, they've chosen to brick up these foundational windows in contrast to the windows that run along the exterior of the building which are preserved. Okay, now I'd like to go back and discuss a specific building attributed to the father here, Richard Morris Hunt, and that is probably one of his most important works, which is Biltmore Estate. So I don't know how neatly and well I can tie this in to everything I've said already, but I have made some notes on the Biltmore Estate, things I thought were interesting. So I'm just going to describe the Biltmore Estate briefly and then drop all these facts I met, I've researched. Okay, I will start with the first paragraph on Wikipedia just to introduce this building. Biltmore Estate is a large 10.86 square mile private estate and tourist attraction in Asheville, North Carolina. So that's talking about the piece of property that this building is on. That's the estate. The Biltmore House, which is the building, is the main residence and it is a chateau-esque style mansion built by George Washington Vanderbilt II between 1889 and 1889. 95 and is the largest privately owned house in the United States at 178,926 square feet of floor space. Still owned by George Vanderbilt's descendants, it remains one of the most prominent examples of the Gilded Age. Now a quick Google search tells me that the first electric power transmission in the United States happened around 1882. So the Biltmore Estate, what year did we say that was? Was built between 1889 and 95, so electric power was already available. But the interesting thing about Biltmore, or the thing that strikes me most, is that the Biltmore Estate had its own power generation contained in the basement of the building, or even the sub-basement, I've got to look into that more. So it had its own power generation ability 
and not only that, it had its it had power regulation as well, so it could regulate the voltage so that light bulbs wouldn't blow up. Okay, the following I'd like to read is from a separate website and it was an article written by a Thomas J. Blaylock who I think it's fair to say was an electrical engineer in the United States and he has many titles behind his name and he wrote this article which he almost defines himself as American archaeology of electric power and it gets very technical to the point where I can't even understand it because he goes into explaining in detail the complex electrical system What's neat is he also provides some pictures on his website, which of course I'm going to include in my video. I will leave a link for this article in the description below because I've actually read it aloud so that I could understand it. But I don't think it's terribly interesting to most people because it is very technical. So I'd just like to read the first paragraph just to get the general idea. While Biltmore is well known it is less well known that the construction of the mansion in the last decade of the 19th century included the installation of a complex and comprehensive electric supply system to generate and distribute electricity for illumination, heating, and a number of electric power uses, many of which were unknown in most buildings of the day. Happily, much of the original equipment, while no longer in use, still remains in the mansion and is being preserved, interpreted, and appreciated. This article is the story of the elaborate, fascinating, and unique Biltmore electric power system. Again, the link for the full reading is in the description below. My point for reading this is, say, going back to the Conspiracy R Us video, which demonstrated that a lot of these Gilded Age mansions had technology which was far ahead of its time. And I think that's a suspicion, and it is for me, to be fair, I don't see a lot of evidence of mud flood on the Biltmore building. The back of the building does have a foundational stone foundation, which is actually uh, kind of like a, a back split. It actually sits at a lower level than the front of the building. But so far as I can tell, it doesn't really have a lot of signs of inundated windows, just to be fair. And also, unlike the majority of Richard Morris Hunt's other uh, mud flood looking buildings. The Biltmore Estate building um, actually has original photography for the construction of it. Um, I'll say it again. The Biltmore Estate has construction photos. Here they are on the screen. I'm a little bit suspicious but I have to be fair because uh, they do exist. Okay so again I've made notes on some interesting details for this building and I'm going to read them into the video. In the Wikipedia article on Biltmore, the house, it says, The steeply pitched roof is punctuated by 16 chimneys and covered with slate tiles that were affixed one by one. Each tile was drilled at the corners and wired. It says that, and wired into the attic's steel infrastructure. People want to talk about atmospheric electricity on buildings? Well, I don't know. I don't know what to make of that. We've got copper flashing of slate tiles and it's uh, wired into the attic's steel infrastructure because the next sentence mentions that this is copper flashing. Copper flashing was then installed okay copper flashing is installed on top. Copper flashing was then installed at the junctions to prevent water from penetrating. The fanciful flashing on the edge of the roof was embossed with George Vanderbilt's initials and motifs from his family crest though the original gold leaf no longer survives. So I don't know, I'm going to leave that open-ended because I don't know the answer, but is copper an effective material for building a roof out of? Is that typical to use copper? Because to me, what strikes me is that copper is conductive and you're putting a conductive material on your roof. And not only that, we have aerials on the roof of this building. And even more interesting is that there's an elaborate and complex electrical system within the basement of this building and throughout the home. Again, this home can generate its own electric power. So I ask if that has anything to do with the copper flashing on the roof. Okay, continuing reading, the Wikipedia article says about the first floor, Biltmore has four acres of floor space and a total of 250 rooms in the house, including 35 bedrooms for family and guests, 43 bathrooms, 65 fireplaces, 
I'm not going to cover that one extensively, but if you watch the Conspiracy R Us video, which is questioning the nature of these fireplaces, well, this Biltmore estate had 65 of them, okay? Three kitchens and 19th century novelties such as electric elevators, forced air heating, centrally controlled clocks, fire alarms, and a call bell system. Okay, so what strikes me is that there's elevators in this building and they are electric. This article also makes mention that there is an organ, an organ gallery. It says, on the opposite end of the hall is an organ gallery that houses a 1916 Skinner pipe organ. Left unfinished with bare brick walls, the music room was not completed and opened to the public until 1976. Well, that's a little bit unusual to me. You've got a building which is historical and old and available to the public, I think beginning in the 50s, uh, I could be wrong, and then there's an organ there and then nobody's able to see it until the 70s. We, that's just weird. Continuing reading regarding the basement, it says guests of the estate could enjoy other activities that were found on the basement level, including an indoor 70,000 gallon heated swimming pool with underwater lighting, one of the nation's first bowling alleys installed in a private residence and a gymnasium with once state-of-the-art fitness equipment. And going back to this Blaylock article, I did want to read something into the video uh, regarding electric heating. An article written by Charles Waddell appeared in the 5th of October 1907 issue of Electrical World and was titled The Electrical Heating Plant of the Biltmore Estate. The heating system for Biltmore was supplied from three large steam boilers that were originally fired by coal or wood. Later on, one of these boilers was converted for oil firing, and all three still exist in the sub-basement today. So, a few things on that. Uh, first of all, there's two basements. This is strange to me. When you build a home, why would you build it with two basements? There could be an argument for that, but that just doesn't sound quite right to me. Not only that, but I think, like, how much coal would it take to burn and boil water so as to heat a house of this size. Now it's a little bit wild and crazy for me to suggest the idea, but I think people who follow my channel are probably on board with me. Could it be that there's atmospheric electricity type of technology in this building, which harnesses electricity through the aerials on the roof and the copper flashing ceiling, transmits this power to the sub-basement where it heats boilers and thus this energy is collected and either converted to electricity and maybe transmitted to the rest of the house? Could that be what's going on? I stand to be corrected, but I thought that was worth mentioning and is food for thought. Okay, so when I was doing research for this video and reading the Wikipedia article on Richard Morris Hunt, the following struck my attention. At the section Career in America, New York early years, there's a sentence that says, Hunt's first substantial project was the 10th Street Studio Building, where he rented a space, and where in 1858 he founded the first American architectural school, beginning with a small group of students, including George B. Post, William Robert Ware, Henry Van Brunt, and Frank Furness. Ware, who was deeply influenced by Hunt, went on to found America's first two university programs in architecture at MIT in 1866 and at Columbia in 1881. Okay, so when I read this sentence, I clicked on all of the names of the different architects, and I opened them up in a separate window just so I could look at the achievements of these architects and they are similar to Hunt who is accredited with a lot of these old buildings so I'm just going to say the name and on the screen you'll just see some of the famous buildings that they built and I'll leave it to you the viewer to judge whether you think these are mud flood era buildings and architectural styles that are suspicious as to whether these men may have built them. So again, I'm going to go slow. Well, I flash the images on the screen. William 
Robert Ware. George B. Post. Uh, keep in mind some of the pictures I'm showing are not complete as to their full body of work. George B. Post. Okay, next here is Henry Van Brunt or Brunt. Frank Hailing Furness Now the last thing that I want to do is start passing judgment upon people and being scathing and harshly criticize them. That's not my intention. That's not what I'm trying to do. But in the case of the Biltmore estate, the whole property, and even the assets that the Vanderbilt family would have owned, I do ask the question as to how they would have acquired all of these things. Yes, they were railroad magnates, and there's probably history that I still stand to investigate, and that is my fault, so I haven't fully read into the history of the Vanderbilt family. And the only reason I mention the following is because I think it might provide some insight as to how these old historical families acquired and owned the industry that they had control over and the assets that they hold. And in specific, I mean land title, like title to property. Not to digress too much, but Rebel Without a Pause, recently on his channel, mirrored a video of a woman who worked in real estate law, and she also made a video on municipal plans, or planning, of buildings. And the short of it is that the original deeds and municipal plans almost indicate that at the time of surveying and planning, these buildings had already existed. Now that's too complicated to re-explain in my video, so I will leave that as a link in the description below. I know I've provided a lot of links and it's hard to look at all this, but I thought that was a good video that speaks to land title, a reset, and mud flood. So anyway, getting to the thing I wanted to point out is that there is a type of trust fund that has been set up by the Vanderbilt family. Okay, so I will just read. This Wikipedia article is entitled The Biltmore Company. The Biltmore Company, headquartered in Asheville, North Carolina, United States, is owned by the family of William Amherst Vanderbilt Cecil and owns and operates Biltmore Estates. In 1999, the company formed a new business group called the Biltmore Estate Brands Group. Okay, so this is going back to the Biltmore Estate Wikipedia article, and at the very end of the article, it says, the estate today covers approximately 8,000 acres and is split in half by the French Broad River overseen by the Biltmore Company. Again, I'm going to look at this. And it says the Biltmore Company is a trust fund, a trust set up by the family. The company is a large enterprise that is one of the largest employers in the Asheville area. And if I go to the Biltmore Company article and I look at the biography on the side, it says it brings in a revenue of $50 million a year, and it employs 2,400 people. Now, once again, I'm not passing judgment on people. The Vanderbilt family may be very good to its employees. Maybe they treat their people very well. Maybe they provide good jobs. Maybe they pay well. Maybe they do the best they can for the people they employ. I don't know that. But my, my point is really just to show that here you have a historical family that owned industry, owned assets, owned land title, and even today they're still influential and they own income generating enterprises. And I just wonder whether this is a model in a lot of the major North American cities and even European cities and every city on earth, whether it's these families that tend to hold title to things and they've done so since something that happened 200 years ago. Now this is very scathing and even dangerous. I, I'm naming names not just 
speaking generally, I'm pointing key figures out. I wonder the same thing about the city I live in, too. And I could be very specific. I could start going into the history. See, a lot of times I think people look to conspiracy theories for explanations. They look to masonry or Illuminati, things that they find on YouTube. And, well, yeah, there might be some answers there, but a lot of times I think that the truth isn't really even a secret. This is uh, information you can find online. I will read the Wikipedia article for Cornelius Vanderbilt, just the beginning. Cornelius Vanderbilt, 1794 to 1877, was an American business magnate and philanthropist who built his wealth in railroads and shipping. Born poor and having only a mediocre education, Vanderbilt worked his way into leadership positions in the inland water trade and invested in the rapidly growing railroad industry. Okay, so I will just leave it open-ended, and there's a lot of things that I still stand to investigate, and I could be proven to be wrong, but I ask the question whether his business acumen, his skill, his intelligence, and his shrewdness for business was really what provided him this vast wealth in industry and estate, or whether something else happened and whether this Vanderbilt history really is a phenomenon that speaks to a lot of other families worldwide that gained prominence and wealth and fortune. Okay, thank you very much for listening, and if the Vanderbilt family is listening, let me tell you, I'm not judging you, and I'm not passing judgment or ridiculing you, but it's about time that we started asking these questions, and I think they're fair to ask, and it's just an investigation. So, thanks for listening. Okay, I just wanted to tag on this clip to the end of my video. <coughs> this is about the Chateau sur Mer, which was a work of Richard Morris Hunt. And I searched for this, and a Bob Vila, a Bob Vila Home Again video came up on YouTube. So, I suppose if I'm going to explore this, I should probably mention like a fair use disclaimer here. So I am using this for educational purposes and my channel is not monetized so I'm not making money off of this and it's widely available on YouTube anyway. I will leave this video as a link in the description below. I will just point out a few interesting notes I made about this video. At 2 minutes and 20 seconds thereabouts presented is one of these old fireplaces, complete with these old uh, dual devices you see at the base of the fireplace, which question has been raised as to what those are. I'd also like to point out that the fireplace mantle itself is made out of wood, which doesn't seem very safe. At 3 minutes and 16 seconds into the video, they talk about how there's gas lighting set up in the house. I thought that was worth noting at 4 minutes and 54 seconds thereabouts they also start remarking on a different fireplace that's also in the house at at 6 minutes and 28 seconds they remark on a grand old mirror which is massive and apparently it has origin at one of the expositions uh, the exhibition in Philadelphia in the early 1850s I think is what they say and it was, the mirror was moved into the house from the exposition. Okay, thank you very much for watching, and I do recommend watching some of these links in the description below.